Are you excited this morning? Are you, are you believing this morning? Are you trusting God this morning? Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Leo, one of the senior pastors here at Love Alive Church, one of the most amazing churches on the planet. I, get, I have the opportunity and the privilege to do life with some of the most amazing people that you could ever meet. As the old people say, they're just the salt of the earth type of people. I'm so excited to be with you this morning. Hopefully up until this point, you have taken time to give God praise. You've taken and you've prioritized your time of worship with God. Don't you dare allow just because you can't walk into some building to, to cause you not to receive everything that God wants to bring about in your life. God is bigger than the buildings. He, he can get stuff to you when you're all by yourself. As a matter of fact, you are a prime candidate when there's no distractions around you for you to hear God's voice and to receive big from God. I, I, I'm saying sometimes I, I remember hearing this old song about the, so some people driving down the road and all of a sudden they get in an accident and they go knock on somebody's door and, and the lady let them in and, and, and the grandma come in and say, can I use your closet? And, and, and she didn't ask for a Bible. She didn't ask to use the bathroom. She said, can I use your closet? Say, I need to call my doctor. Now, there wasn't a phone in the closet. There wasn't, there, there wasn't anything in the closet, but she understood I need to steal away for a moment just to get in the presence of Mr. Creator. And, and so she went in there and she began to talk to Mr. Creator. And all of a sudden, a doctor that wasn't on site, all of a sudden there was a knock at the door and say, say it just happens to be the doctor. Sometimes you have to just steal away. Sometimes you have to remove yourself from all distractions. Don't you dare let a tragic moment determine your fate. I'm saying that the time you need to believe the biggest, the time you need to dig in the hardest, the time you need to reach out like you've never reached before is when it looks like all the odds are against you. It looks like the devil's going to win. But as I told you before, my wife says that you have God's word that the devil will not win. So you have to live your life just like that. Don't you be moved by situations and circumstances. You only be moved by what the Word of God says. And we're going to dig in a little bit more this morning. We're going to still talk about faith, the tool of the believer. And this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about faith in the promises of God. Your God is a promise-keeping God. When God makes you a promise, don't you dare walk around and begin to question whether or not it will come to pass. God knew the, end, the, the outcome. He knew the end of what he said before he spoke it. He had already given your destiny permission to go and land into your world before he ever said anything. So don't you dare let circumstances and things that appear to look like they're blockers when it comes to the promises of God, don't you dare allow those things to prevent you from receiving. He is still a promise-keeping God. Let's go before the throne. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for leaving your word, giving us promises in your word of things that we can depend on. Letting us know, God, that your track record is awesome, that your track record is good. Letting us know, God, that, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. So, Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, I give you permission to go out in front of me. I'll follow you, sir. I yield my vocal cords unto you. I will let you speak into the lives of the people. You are much more capable of touching and changing and rearranging their lives than Leo. So I'm privileged to partner with you this morning. I'm privileged to always follow your lead. Thank you for allowing this old boy to stand and speak on your behalf. I'm honored. And I thank you that you will penetrate the airways. There will be a thickness in the rooms, in the cars, on the jobs, wherever there are people that are releasing faith, I thank you, Lord, that there will be such a presence there, God, to where they are know, God, that you've come in and you have filled the space and miracle signs and wonders will show up. Burdens will be removed and yokes will be destroyed today, not tomorrow, but now faith is. So we trust you. We trust you that questions that they've been seeking answers for. Today is the day when they will get a rhema word. So Father, we love you and adore you. Thank you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, do you have your Bibles? If, if you don't have your Bibles, I need you to get up from your from where you're sitting right now, or where you're lying at, and go get your Bibles. We are a Bible teaching church, and therefore we believe that anything that we say, you should be able to see it in the Word of God. I like to believe that I'm an honest preacher, but, but it's not about how honest I am. It's about you being equipped when the devil show up on your turf. You're being able to take the Word of God and use it like a mechanic does tools to back the enemy up off of you. So by this time, we should be good. So go ahead and get your Bible and hold your Bibles up however you read the Bible, whether it's from a hard copy Bible or whether it's from your, 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 your phones or your laptops or your iPads. And however you read the Bible, go ahead and lift it up. Other than if it's a desktop, don't you do it. And repeat after me. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I am a doer and not just a hearer. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and continue our series, Faith, the Tool of the Believer. And our subtopic this morning is, is Faith in the Promises of God. God has made promises to us. Not only do we have faith in the one that gave, made the promises, but we also have faith in the promises that the promises will make their way into our lives. So if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to Numbers, the 13th chapter. Numbers, the 13th chapter. I'm going to start out reading from uh, verses 1 down through 3. One through three. That just came out wrong. Kind of funny. <laughs> got too many thus. Yeah. And the word of God reads, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spout the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. So Moses then so Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran according to the command of the Lord. All of them, men who were heads of the children of Israel. So in these few scriptures, we see here that God made a promise. Here's where God makes the promise to give the Israelites the land of Canaan. So, so first of all, before you can... Be believe or expect anything, you got to make sure that there's a word concerning whatever you're believing for. And once you know that there's a word where God approved what you're believing for, then it's your job to not let go of it until it takes place. And here the Israelites, they, God says, hey, send out some spies. Send out some guys, some leaders. And why do you send out spies? Why do you send out leaders? It was never designed for the spies or the leaders to go out and validate the promise. The, 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 the spies and the leaders were job was to go out and basically get a vision of what God had promised and begin to tell the testimony of what the people can expect. Create an image on the inside of the people so the people expectation would come up. So go out and see leaders and when you come back I need for you to sow vision into the lives of the people. But that's not how it went at first. So now if we look at Numbers, the 13th chapter, uh, 17th down through the 20th verse, it reads, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see the land is like whether the people who dwelt in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. See, this is where this kind of went south at. Moses began to give 
instructions. God said, go spy out the land. Go check the land out. You know, it's kind of like if you got a house or something you want and somebody say, we might not say go spy. We say, go look at the house and tell me what you think. That's what God, God said, go look at it and just come back and tell. God already know. But Moses goes on to say, I need you to go. And what I need for you to do now, I need you to see whether or not it's a good land. Like God would promise something bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go see what the inhabitants look like, you know. See, see, let, let's see whether or not they got a fortress around it to where we have to fight real hard to get it. You know, Mo, Moses thinking in the flesh. Moses forgetting that, first of all, you didn't ask for the, for the land. So why do you think you got to do everything to occupy the land? Here it is. God said, I'm going to give you the land. Now, what I need you to do is go check it out. And all of a sudden, Moses gives additional instructions. He said, hey, I need for you to go out there and see who live in the land. And, and, and God didn't ask him to say now, ask them to find out how strong or weak the people are. What, matter does, what does it matter whether or not the people are strong or weak when God has sent you and told you that he's going to give you something? Is there a person on the planet, is there an army on the planet that can prevent God from getting what God say he wants? So that was not relevant what Moses asked there. And then say now, did God ask you to uh, care about whether there was a few or many like God didn't know. Like God had already surveyed the situation. He had already gone out and he didn't know who lived in the land. He didn't know that there were giants in the land. He didn't know that there were big grapes in the land. He didn't know that the land was a prosperous land. It's almost like Moses had to go get information and come back and report to God and say, well, God, this is what's in the land. Like God caught God off guard. Well, God, you didn't know that there's some giants over here in this land. And, and, and God, you didn't know that, that, that really now, the, the land might be good, it might be bad. We don't really know what the land is like. It's almost like he's telling God something because God just didn't know before he made a promise. Why would God promise something and he didn't already survey the situation? Why, why would God say he's going to give you something and he already saw, he talked about the blessings of the Lord, make it thee rich and addeth no sorrow. So now you know if God sent you to a land and it's impossible you to, for you to win the battle to get the land, he, he can't say he gave it to you. First of all, if, if you got to fight that hard for it, if you just got to go in there and everything that requires you to get the land is dependent on you and not God, well, really, God didn't give you the land. A bully could have did that. When God simply told them that he's given them the land, the thing that you do, don't add to it, rest in what God said. Yeah. See, many times what we do, we have a promise from God and we respond just like Moses. We got to go survey the promise of God. We got to go out and see, see, you know, immediately move into action because we're not looking at God doing it. We're looking at us doing it. So, so here it is. God tell you to do something. All of a sudden, I'm going to bring you out of debt. And then all of a sudden you go out there and get in debt trying to get out of debt. Why? Because you could, if you could have fixed it, you would have did it without God. So there are promises that God has given you. There are promised situations that, 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 that God know exist in your life. He has some good plans for you and I. But the problem is many times we get in God's way. We, 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 instead, of, instead of partnering with God and doing like the Bible says, acknowledge him, acknowledging him in all of our ways and allowing him to direct our pathway, make our pathway straight, a lot of times we don't acknowledge him. We hear one thing and then we run with it, not taking time to get the rest of the instructions. And that's kind of what Moses did here. Moses sent those guys out and they say, hey, go look at all this stuff now. Go out there. Go out there and see. See what kind of children they have. See how big they are. I'm talking about see whether or not the ground is good. Come on, bring us some fruit back. Let us, you know, just some, a demonstration of what we're going to be dealing with. And, and, so, and they did just that. They did just that. Now, numbers the... 13th chapter, 23rd verse says, Then they came to the valley of Echo, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. Now here it is. God tell you to go out and say, hey, go out there and check out the land. Go spy on the land. And then what happens, you get there and you see a grapevine. I need to borrow your imagination for a minute. Now, many of you eat grapes and you've never walked into the Publix or the Winn-Dixie or the Walmart and picked up some grapes and it took two men to carry them. 
I, I, so, so imagine it. Here it is. Two men got a bunch of grapes on a stick carrying them. What kind of land was this that God promised? What kind of land was this? And, and so, so here it is. The land is so fruitful that it took two men to carry one bunch of grapes. The land was what we call ready for move in. Have you ever thought about, you know, there are certain properties, if you're in real estate, they'll tell you, say, hey, it's already ready for you to move in. That, that's implying that everything that you need is already in place. All you got to do is just bring your few belongings and it's ready for you to occupy. So the land of Canaan was ready to be occupied. The only problem was God just had to evict the people that were residents in it. And God had already planned this you know, long before he even made the promise to the Israelites. So here it is now. We are getting into a place to where we're going to see how this thing unfold. Numbers, the 13th chapter, 26 down through the 27th verse. And it reads, now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Haran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation. And showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows. It don't just flow. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. So he, they should have stopped right there. They should have just stopped right there. Uh, they say now, it, it, oh, it's everything that God said. It, oh, it's flowing with milk and honey. Honey, it, it is fruitful. And here's some of the fruit to show that we're not just making this up. And if they would have only just stopped right there. Yeah, yeah, don't say no more. Just hush. Just hush right there. Let the book stop, right? Let, let this chapter right here stop right there. Because as they begin to continue to speak, this is where... Thing started. Now they come back and say uh, in verse thir uh, 13 chapter 20 through the 29th verse says, nevertheless, don't you hate nevertheless? That means I done said it on one end, but nevertheless, forget almost, forget what I just said. I got something else I want to tell you. So nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak, of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, all the ites all over the place. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and long, along the banks of the Jordan. So here it is. The spies go on to say, nevertheless, or you could say it like this. Now that I have told you the good news, I got some bad news for you. The real deal is the cities are very large and strongly defended. Now, we can install these people great, and we barely got out for our li with our lives. Now, we brought you the grapes back, the fruit, like you said, Moses. Yes, it's a beautiful land, Moses, but now I got some nevertheless for you. With all that being said, Moses, there are some big people there. And, 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 and it's not just, you don't just walk up on them. Their land is well fortified. That means they got, they, they got barriers to keep people from just sneaking in on them, Moses. What do you do with that? Don't you wish they would have just hushed? Don't you wish they just told you the good and just don't, not leave out the never, the never for less? You don't need to never for less when God tells you to do something. God didn't ask you to go in there and survey and size up the people that was going to be in the land. He just told you, go take a look at it. Take a look, come back, make a report. It, it's not about you trying to decide whether or not the battle is possible for you to win. Because what they begin to do, they begin to talk themselves out of the promise of God. Have you ever been promised something by God and all of a sudden you got a little bit into your own way? Have you ever just, here it is, God told you something and because you had never seen it and because it looked like somebody else had already occupied the space and all of a sudden you start seeing it and then you start seeing how much you don't have and all of a sudden you begin to retreat back into the shadow. Wow. Oh, God couldn't have told me, no, God, no, I didn't hear God. 
Really, God didn't know. God haven't been down here to see this land. He don't even know the people that live in the land. And all of a sudden, he telling us, come on, go out there. He going to give us the land. Are he, is he aware of these are some big, strong people that live in this land? So what we going to do, go knock on the door and say, hey, the Lord said that, that your land belonged to me. Well, I'm saying if the Lord said that, knock on the door and tell him, say, now I understand. I'm not looking for a fight. I ain't looking for no fight, big guy. But I am telling you, I would start packing if I was you. I will start packing if I was you. I have God's word that this land that you occupy belong to me. Now, I ain't in for a big debate. I am not in for a big debate. See, see, that's how you, that, you, you got to have courage. When God tell you something, you don't have to go a wishing and a begging and a pleading. You just walk with confidence. Say, now, nah, I don't mean you no harm. I don't, I don't mean you no harm. As a matter of fact, I didn't come up with it. I just happened to be his favorite son, his favorite daughter, and he just felt like this would do me good. So now, I, if I was you, I'd start packing. Somebody's occupying some of your stuff. Somebody has something that belonged to you that God promised you. Uh, you understand that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. So, so now, if it's laid up, if, 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 if the wealth of the wicked means that the wicked already possess it, is laid up for you, now, don't you think that God might start giving you some instructions just like he did the children of Israel? The Israelites say, hey, hey, uh, that belongs to you over there. I understand somebody already lived there. I understand. I got that. I understand. But really, the purpose was so that it would be ready for you to live in when you got there. See, let somebody else go ahead and take the hit on it. Let somebody. God could have just gave you a big bare land and let you do all the building. But instead of him just giving you a land, he'll call somebody else to put the sweat equity in and build the houses and build the fortresses and build the wealth for you and, and go ahead and possess the car for you. You know, go ahead and do all the stuff that manual labor would normally take. He say, look, I, I, I love you so much. Well, I just want you to be able to just walk in. I just want you to walk in and just enjoy. Just enjoy. This is on me. This is on the house. Yeah, this is on the house. So, so now, but, but if you don't think a certain way, you'll walk around and when, when God tells you something, you'll begin to think that it's too good to be true. Yeah. You, 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 you'll, you'll, you'll walk around and you'll begin to act as though it's not possible. You'll begin to disqualify yourself. And we're going to see how they did that. Verse 30 says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Here it is. Caleb saw where the conversation was going. Caleb saw they're about to blow it. They're about to move out of faith. And boy, they're about to release some fear, doubt, and unbelief in the building. So Caleb interrupted them. Say, hey, hey, stop, 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 stop. Before we think ourselves out of what God has promised us, let's go now. We are well able to possess the land. Forget about who live in the land. Forget about what you saw. I'm sure Caleb remembered what God is saying. You have God's word that God is going to give you this so you don't have to sit back and entertain who's there and what it's going to require for you to get it. Let's go now because we have God on our side. Have you ever decided that you're going to move past your thoughts, move past your mind, get out of your own way, trust God more than you trust yourself? What does it mean to begin to walk by faith and not by sight? Because can I tell you something? If, if, you, if you don't know it yet, if you look at everything based on it being possible or not in the natural, you will always disqualify yourself. Anything big, only thing you'll settle for a small task that you know it don't require much for you to accomplish. But the big things in life, you're going to have to see it before you see it. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have to see it before you see it. Yeah. I heard a preacher say last night, say that if, if you can't see it in your mind, yeah. your eyes are useless. Yeah. Yeah. We ride down the car. I said, oh, that was good. Pastor. What, 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 what was that? What was that? I said, he, he said that if you can't see it in your mind, in your imagination first, your eyes do not work. Because if I tell you a black dog with polka dots, a black dog with white polka dots on it, you don't see it with your eyes, but you see it. So what do you really see out of? Is it your eyes that give you vision or is it your image, your imagination? Is it your mind that you see out of? Many times because we trust what we can see in the natural, we limit 
the power of your imagination, the power of locking down. When God makes a promise, begin. Why, why, was, it, why was it important for them to go out and spy out the land? Well, not only do you need to have a word from God, but see, then once you get a word from God, even in the natural right now, if God has promised you something, it's always good to find some pictures or something, something that you could put up that, that's a visual for you so that you can see it. And then you're saying it and you're seeing it. You're saying it and you're seeing it. And the more you say and you see, then guess what? The more real it becomes to you. Yeah. Treat the promises of God like that. Learn how to utilize your face to pull in whatever it is that you want. Yeah. Learn how to, to, to hear God's voice. But when you hear God's voice, don't you dare start holding a conversation that will push the promises of God farther away from you than they will be pulling them closer to you. These guys here, what they were doing, they went out to survey the land, to spound the land. But then when they came back, they, they, they immediately began to talk about not what God said, but they began to develop their faith in what they had seen. And because they were developing their faith in what they had seen, now they were about to get something that they did not want. Because, see, faith works good. Um, faith works on both sides of the equation. It, it works. The God kind of faith brings in the things that you want, that you're believing God for. That would be a blessing unto your life. But then it also requires faith for you to have a life that you don't want. Because faith is based on your belief. Faith is based on when you see. What do you, where do you see yourself at? What do you see yourself accomplishing in life? What do you see when you read the Bible? Is the Bible just a good storybook for you, or do you really believe that it, the Bible is alive? It's God's instructions to how you can pull it off on this planet. Do you believe that? Because it, it's, it's based on your belief in the promise of God, because I can tell you that if you walk around and you start looking at everything that you do, initially, it's like walking up to a, a piece of land and you're seeing it as a campus. Well, I'm looking at a piece of land right now. But I tell you what, I, I see it as a campus. But there are trees all over it. I mean, there's not a building on it. I don't even know what's up in the building, up in the weeds. I don't even know what's behind the trees. But I, I, I see it as a campus. So when I walk by it, hey, what I do, I place it. I say, oh, yeah, that, ooh, that'd be good right there. Oh, dear, ooh, Lord, look at that pond right there. Ooh, look at that pond. And then I went out down, sat down, uh, 95, and there's a new community back there where they have this, these man-made beaches, and they got this, these chemicals that they put in the water, make it real blue. I'm talking about like when you go way out in the ocean. I'm talking about blue, pretty blue. So I, 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 I said, well, how do I get that? I said, because I don't want muddy water in front of the church. The church should have good blue water. So, so, so I, I, when I ride by that property, I see the lights up under the ground hidden up. I see the sprinklers sprinkling. I see that I'm talking about pretty blue water right out there in front of it. And I see vegetation. I see tropical trees that when you pull up on it, I'm talking about it's going to look like God lives there. I, I see it. Why? I don't have it yet, but, but I, I see it. And why? Because I believe that if, if, if when the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon, and the, the Bible says that he, Solomon functioned at such a high level, say his excellence just took her breath away. So, so, so I, I have an image of something being so spectacular that it causes you to have to grasp your wind. So, so the goal is to breathe something, to build something to where in the name of God. So when you pull up on it, you be like, ooh, yeah. woof. Not to make Leo famous. I just serve an awesome God because I believe if you're going to do it, you should do it big. That's right. I believe if anybody's going to have it, and my wife and I, we studied the book, The Five Star Church, a long time ago. Yeah. See, I believe that your experience should be when you pull up on God's property, I believe not only does the presence of God should reside there, I believe when you walk up there, I'm talking about everything. If he got streets of gold, if I could get to a place where I have streets of gold to model my daddy, you'd be rolling up on some streets of gold. I'm talking about crystal clear rivers. That, that, that's what's in heaven if you haven't gone that far into the Bible. So, so if, if God rolled like that, then I'm a representation of God. And God has made me promises. According to my faith, according to your faith, be it done unto you, then you got to change the way that you think, to change the way that you believe. Don't leave things to chance. You got to talk to it enough, whatever it is, until it be moves from the invisible into 
the realm of your reality. You just got to keep talking. And, and my wife will tell you, I get a little frustrated if I ride by the prop and I don't thank God for it. See, every time I ride, Father, I thank you so much for Love Alive Church Campus property. I thank you, Lord, for every structure that will be on it. I thank you that we are a debt-free ministry. I thank you, Father, that our reach extends far beyond the borders of America. Thank you so much, God. Why? Because we understand that there's no shortage in the earth. I didn't get into preaching for money. I understand I got enough dreams, and most people that know my wife and I, you know our hands going to be on enough stuff to, boy, one day, <laughs> real in the near future, it's got to come to pass. So it's never about money. It's all about how do I change the world, do my part in changing the world for Jesus. And, 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 and many people's problem is they won't release their faith because they don't believe it can happen. And then when they are releasing their faith, their dreams, their visions are so tiny to where it's all about them. Well, 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 really, you got to see yourself as a water hose that God water, send water through. See, the water hose got to get wet anytime water go through it. But it, the water is not for the hose. The water is for what's on the other side of the hose. The hose get the benefit of being a hose. It get wet simply because it's a hose. So that's how we want to live our lives as Christians. See, see. All the things that you're believing for, I'm telling you life is much bigger than a house, a car, money, jewelry, and all that kind of stuff. Because when you have all that stuff there, what's next? Well, I could tell you that the Bible says that the poor are going to always be with you. So my job and your job, Christian, is to believe big enough to where you can funnel stuff through you and change the lives of other people. There are things happening in the world right now. Forty-something million people lost their jobs. Many of the jobs won't come back. You got to position yourself. If you want to glorify God, you got to be in position so that when need presents itself in your presence, you can annihilate the need and do it saying, God bless you on the other end of it. And that's why the devil don't want the church to talk about money. Money is just a tool. It's something that you use, just like faith is the tool of the believer. Well, money is the tool of the believer also. When you get enough money, you can change things. You, you have some family members that need help. There are some homeless people that are sitting up on the bridges. They need a second shot. There are some people standing on the corner with signs asking for stuff. They're not running games. Some of them are, but everybody's not running a game. What would it feel like to ride by some little mama, and she got a little baby in a carriage and another one on the side, and she's just trying to get to work? Will you be the person pull up and buy the car for her? I'm talking about not a hoopty, not something that's going to break down. I'm talking about taking to the car lot and just say, hey, baby, God bless you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about the promises of God. The promises of God. When you believe them, when you get outside of yourself and then you stop being selfish and you stop thinking that it's, it, your life is, was given to you only for you. Your life was given to you with you came with something on the inside of you that you're supposed to deposit back into the earth. You should be walking by people and everywhere that you step, somebody's life should get better. Why? Because you understand your assignment. Yeah. 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 This, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you into my heart. See, I'm letting, I'm, I, if you get close enough, you'll understand that. See, if you get close enough, you, if you follow me, you'll understand that I don't just stand up here and say this stuff. I, I, I get pleasure out of walking in a place and paying, some, paying for somebody's debt. I get pleasure walking in the grocery store and just paying somebody and then telling them, now they don't need to know who it is. They don't need, let me leave. Don't, don't, don't tell them. Why? Because really, I just, I, and I always say, tell them God bless them. See, see why? Because I don't need you to know who I am. I need to take every moment that I can so that somebody will give God praise. Somebody who was, didn't feel like they stood a chance. Somebody who feel like they were invisible. They realized that there's a God that sits high and he looked low and he put them on somebody else's heart. They don't know who it is, but they know that God did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give God the credit. Give God the credit. Use your faith. Like a mechanic does his tools, but be strategic in knowing why. Why is it important for you to become who you were created to be? God gave you an assignment simply because somebody was going to need what you were sent to the planet to give. Don't you dare disqualify yourself and begin to act as though, man, I don't bring no skin to the game. I'm telling you, if you have breath in you, God has deposited something on the inside of you that you're supposed to give birth to to make a difference. 
And if you ever decide that you're going to believe God and the promises that God has made you, if you ever decide that you're going to walk this thing out, if you ever decide that you're going to make your life more than just something that elevates you, the journey gets good then. If you ever decide that, 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 that really the thing that put the biggest smile on my face and on my wife's face is not when somebody gives us a gift. It's when we could give somebody else one. Yes, yes, yes. See, see I, I ain't living my life for somebody to pay for my dreams. I believe that the father that I love, that I serve, that I'm totally committed to, I believe he's given me everything that I need. to Whatever it is my heart's desire is, I believe that he'll bring it into my world. But I also decided a long time ago, I don't want to be the person standing in the line of need. I want to be the person sitting at the desk administering blessings. That's who I want to be. I want to be the person to where when you have a need and it don't look like there's any hope, we show up and we change your lives. And the blessing to me is to see the smile on your face or the tears run down your face because you live to fight another day. If you want to make God proud, learn what he's promised you. Embrace what God has promised you. And go on a crusade to change the world. How do you change an angry world? You change an angry world by the Bible says that through love. Love is more than a conversation. Sometimes love is a, it, it's, all the time, love is more of a, a verb, more of an action word than anything. We treat it as though it's passive. But love will cause you to, 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 to do whatever is necessary to change the lives that are around you. Do whatever is necessary so that when people look out, they'll know that God still has sons and daughters who love him. Numbers, the 13th chapter, 31st down through the 33rd verse. It reads, but the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone and as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Here, the sad thing about this scripture here, God made a promise several verses up and sent men out to go out and spy the land and just see the blessing that God had promised. But they came back and instead of seeing it the way that God wanted them to see it, they came back and they say all of the, the impossibilities of them having it. They thought so hard and so long of all the bad things to where they began to see themselves as less than me and say, man, we look like little grasshoppers compared to these guys. And then they go on to see and to say, not only do we see ourselves as grasshoppers, but they see us as grasshoppers also. Now that confused me because you didn't talk to nobody in the land. So how did you know what they thought? But if you begin to allow your mind to go in the wrong direction, you'll begin to see things and come up with conversations and, and you'll validate those conversations in your mind when all the time God made a promise to you and he didn't tell you to try to figure out how it was going to get done. Your only job was to hear what God said and trust what God said. Don't look at the, 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 the goal or the task that God gave you to the point where it's an impossible task. It became possible when your God gave it to you. 
Many of you have retreated in life because you saw things that you were supposed to be a part of or supposed to do. But because of how you see yourself out of your own eyes, you never saw yourself being able to accomplish it. You saw yourselves as grasshoppers based on what God had told you to do. Well, I want to tell you today, I need you to change how you think. I need you to begin to see yourself as being the mighty men and the mighty women of God. I need you to be able to see yourself as God's sons and daughters. I need you to be able to see that that, that no weapon formed against you will prosper. I, I need to be able. I need you to be able to see that. I, I know that some things that you're supposed to do, they look like big mountains. But I need you to remember that the Word of God says, "Speak to the mountain, and it shall be removed." So I, I need for you to build up your your confidence right now. I need for you to know that God has made you promises, and God is more than able to carry out what He has promised. I know sometimes it looks hard. I saw. I know sometimes it doesn't look like it's possible. But I'm telling you that it's possible. I'm telling you that I need for you to just believe again. I, I need for you to have courage again. I need for you to trust again, not yourself, not in your ability. I need for you to trust God again. And some of you, you lost your hope. You came into the family of God with, oh, believing all things are possible. And many of you have disconnected from the promises of God because you've experienced what we call church hurt. You're at a place of discouragement. You, you, you want to believe, but you've been beat down so much. You've been used so much. You've been conned so much to where you, you in your mind now, the, the first obstacle is to get to a place to where you believe the word of God is true again. And understand every person that stands before you and they say that God said doesn't mean that God said it. That's why you got to get the Bible before yourself. Prove what people tell you. I'm telling you things that if you pick the book up, you'll realize that God has made promises to you in his word. And he's not a God that will change his mind. Now some of you have never ever received the first promise. And that was when God sent his only begotten son. His name is Jesus. To shed his life for you. So if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, don't do like the spies. Don't overthink it. One of the reasons why many people don't answer the call to salvation is because you're overthinking it. You, once again, you see yourself as a grasshopper. You don't see yourself as worthy of God's love. You don't believe that even God can forgive you for the things that you've done. But I'm saying that just like the land that was promised, it wasn't based on how good or bad they were. I'm saying the gift of salvation is the same. I'm saying that it's not based on what you've done. It's based on what you will do to make things right with God. So if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for loving me. And Lord Jesus, I choose this day to believe in my heart and to confess with my mouth that you are the Son of God and that you were raised from the dead. And from this day forward, I choose, I would live my life serving you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying the price for me. In Jesus' name. And then there's another group of you out there. You have tasted. You have confessed the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. But something happened during your journey. Something happened where you got off track. And you, you, you disappointed yourself and you've disappointed some others. And because you knew better and you messed up, you're now disqualifying yourself for the love of God. I'm here to tell you that God is not mad with you. 
I'm here to tell you that, guess what? God has been waiting on you to just come back the whole time. So if you know that you have messed up and you know that you are not in right standing right now with God because of bad decisions, all you need to do is rededicate your life. You ain't got to jump through hoops. You ain't got to prove yourself. If you would, I want you to pray this next prayer with me. Say, Father God, thank you for loving me. And I choose this day to rededicate my life back unto you. I'll trust you more than I trust myself. And from this day forward, my plan is to spend every day with you. So thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for everyone that's on the other side of the airways or even in this building that have decided today that they would either give their life to the Lord Jesus for the very first time or that they would rededicate their lives. Thank you, Lord, for being a God that loves us. Thank you for all our new family members. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed either one of those prayers, if you gave your life to the Lord for the very first time or if you uh, rededicated your life, what I want you to do is I want you to just type in the comments section and just say, that's me. And what we want to do, we want to send you a little booklet, a little pamphlet that kind of explains what's next. Uh, if you happen to mess up again or just a good read to kind of give you instructions on questions that you might have. So just say, that's me. And we'll get this out to you. And if you have something that you need us to pray with you about, I'm asking that you would please put that in there. Uh, and let us know. We would be glad to pray with you or pray about things that are concerning you. And once again, welcome to you all that have become a part of the family for the very first time. And welcome home to those of you that rededicated your life. We love you so much. And we thank you once again. Thank you for joining us every week. Hopefully your lives are being the better because you show up. Hopefully something is happening that will change your life. And we love you. And thank you for hanging out with us. And before Pastor Leo leaves, on yesterday he celebrated a birthday. Woo, woo, woo. Woo. He thought he had gotten away. <laughs> wow. Thought I was out of it. Thought he was out of it. So yesterday we blessed him real well. Yeah. Took him all around the city and gave him all this this um almost a scavenger hunt and he didn't know what was happening. <laughs> a real blessing to him yeah and this morning for those of you who are not here you can't see but we have a beautiful cake and a little celebration for him right after service but we want to publicly just say thank you so glad you were born yes, Lord. so many years thank ago you, so many <laughs> 58 years ago <laughs> yes so we want to say, we want to sing happy birthday to you as we end this broadcast today a little bit differently. Thank you guys so much for joining us on today. And we want you to come back, but we do want to sing happy birthday and then we'll be done with service. All right. Huh? The, the traditional version. <laughs> okay, y'all ready? Let's sing. 